this um, title page is how you get by a three slide limit. You start your presentation on your title page. <laughs> now my um, presentation is going to be redundant to all of you who looked at Vasanti's last slide and understood it perfectly. <laughs> but if you didn't, hang in there because um, I'm going to basically be describing in detail why do we see these adverse metabolic effects when we simply do something as simple as replace the bread in that sandwich with another carbohydrate, in this case, fructose? So um, in my studies and in John Mark Schwartz's studies where his patients, we both had patients living at uh, CCRC facilities for days at a time, controlled diets, and did these simple replacements. High fruct, not sorry, fructose for bread, rice, complex carb. And in both cases, we saw very big differences. So let's start with glucose. What happens? when we eat glucose. Now, we really don't consume glucose-sweetened beverages. Most of our glucose comes in the form of our complex carbohydrates, which of course get broken down into our intestine into the free glucose, which is picked up by the portal vein and delivered directly to the liver. This gives the liver first rights to all the sugars we consume. Now, the liver can do two things. It can pull that glucose or sugar into the liver and use it. It can turn it into glycogen. It could turn it into energy. Um, or the liver can choose not to pull that glucose in and allow the glucose to bypass the liver and head to the rest of the body. Now, the decision as to whether that glucose stays in the circulation and heads to the rest of the body or gets pulled into the liver is made by the enzyme phosphofructose kinase, the rate-limiting enzyme for glucose. Fro phosphofructose kinase, or PFK though, is regulated by hepatic energy status. That means if the liver needs energy, PFK is turned on and the glucose goes into the liver and gets used by the liver, either as energy or to replace the glycogen stores. However, if the liver does not need energy, then PFK is inhibited. Therefore, the glucose bypasses the liver, heads to the rest of the body where it can be used for any other purpose, the brain, the muscle, the nerve cells, the fat cells. Now, the story is different with fructose. Fructose and glucose are identical when you're talking about chemical composition, but they're different when it talk about molecular, and that makes all the difference. Fructose, too. In this case, most of our fructose is coming from sugar-sweetened beverages or the desserts we eat. It, too, goes from the intestine into the portal vein and goes directly to the liver. The difference, though, is that the enzyme in charge of fructose's fate is not regulated by hepatic energy balance. This is a really important difference. That means there's no decision here. Whether the liver needs glucose, I mean energy or not, this enzyme, fructokinase, is turn on, turned on, it's activated. Therefore, in the case where the liver needs energy, in goes the fructose. But in the case that the liver does not need the energy, we still have a green light. In goes the fructose. Very little of the fructose escapes 
fat pull into the liver, very little fructose, even after a big gulp, ends up in the blood. Instead, it's in the liver, and what we have is fructose overload in the liver. So, why is that a problem? Well, the liver does its best it can with this overload of substrate. It turns some of it into energy, some of it into lactate, some of that fructose gets turned back to glucose and in, uh, stored as glycogen. But the leftover causes an upregulation of de novo lipogenesis, the process by which the liver turns sugar into fat. With the increase in de novo lipogenesis, we get a concurrent inhibition of fat oxidation, which makes sense. Our bodies are smart. We don't make fat and burn fat at the same time. Therefore, by both processes, we are increasing fat accumulation in the liver. With increased fat in the liver, we get upregulation of VLDL production and secretion. VLDL being very low density lipoprotein, the particle by which our liver packs triglyceride and cholesterol for sending it out into the bloodstream. Therefore, we now have increased triglyceride and cholesterol in the blood. The tri triglyceride increase is absolutely immediate. The cholesterol increase takes at longer to show up, um, but it does show up within nine days for sure, which is one of the shorter studies that have been done. But some of that fat stays in the liver, and the liver fat can then impair insulin action, increase hepatic insulin resistance. And here's where the problem really starts, because when insulin can't do its job, then all sorts of other bad things happen, including you get even further upregulation of de novo lipogenesis. And what you see now then is the potential for this really vicious cycle in the purple arrows there. And to make it really clear, it's basically the hepatic insulin resistance increases the de novo lipogenesis. The de novo lipogenesis is increasing the liver fat, and that's in further increasing the insulin resistance. And you can see how hard it would be to break this vicious cycle when with daily fructose consumption. And then, since both hepatic insulin resistance and increased liver fat will operate, further upregulate the LDL production and secretion, then we get even more triglyceride exposure in the blood, and this leads to eventually accumulation of fat in the fat cells, and I'm sorry, fat in the muscle cells, and with that we believe we're increasing whole body insulin resistance, which of course is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Now, while this is going on, we have another pathway which may also be problematic, and that's increased fructose in the liver increases uric acid production. Now, we've known for years and years that uric acid is associated with gout, but the recent literature suggests, at the very least, it's a strong biomarker, but maybe even a contributor mediator of metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and chronic kidney disease. And that is the main mechanisms at this point by which we believe fructose is uniquely capable of mediating dysregulation of lipid and carbohydrate metabolism. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Vicente. Basanti. Um, you might have missed it because I was a little late. the mic. I might have missed this. I'm not sure if you mentioned this um, at the beginning of your She slide. cited your slide. Oh, 
<laughs> that, that's not, not actually my question, but good to know. Um, so one of the things we saw at the very beginning, I think, um, that the amount of fructose in an apple versus an apple juice is pretty much the same, the amount of sugars. So then there's this concern of, well, if we eat a lot of fruit, which is a lot of fructose, are we going to see this happen? And so it seems like there's something about this rate of fructose absorption, right, that's different. And I was wondering if you could speak um, to that a little bit. It um, is very clear that my studies, let's say John Mark Schwartz's study, is limited by the fact that we are comparing a beverage to a starch and the starch is in solid form because we're not very good at putting starch in liquid form. And so what definitely is needed at this point in time is more studies exactly like what Vasanti suggests. We need solid fruit versus fruit juice. We need solid candy versus beverage. These questions have not been answered. However, I do want to remind everybody, you have to go way back, all the way to the Riser studies. He did some really excellent studies back in the late 70s, early 80s, in which he did compare solid starch to solid sucrose. He called them sucrose patties. And basically, during his studies, which were always six weeks long, he would give subjects absolutely controlled, identical diets, with the only difference being they would get a certain percentage of their daily intake as a solid starch patty versus a solid sugar patty. Would love to know how he did it. No idea whether you, it, it, they contained a lot of fat. The details aren't there. But he definitely has the strongest evidence so far that our sugars in solid food do not get a free ride. I mean, we, they're not a clean bill of health. He saw very definite increases in risk factors in his subjects um, with the solid sugar compared to the solid starch. That's our best evidence so far when we look at, yes, we no beverages are the worst, but where do we stand with solid sugar? Um, I am hoping, uh, keep my fingers crossed every day, every time I look at my email, my heart beats, because I'm hoping to find out that I got funded for a study which will include the comparison of the beverage versus um, isocaloric amounts of solid sugar in a protocol in which everything else in the diet is held absolutely equal. Is solid sugar candy? I'm trying to figure out what solid sugar is. Sure, yeah. Solid sugar would be candy, cake, brownies, cookies, and it's a very hard study to do um, because, for example, I got all excited. There's a candy out there that kids know about and parents will know about, nerds. Kids love nerds. That is one candy that's 100% sugar. So I was saying, oh, this is exciting. I can use that as part of my study. Well, then I read it more closely. The first ingredient is dextrose. And therefore, it's not going to be the proper comparison. I need something that's either pure sucrose or pure high fructose corn syrup in my source to compare to my beverage. So it's going to take a lot of effort to equalize the diets and uh, account for the extra fat and car starch and sometimes even a bit of protein that's usually in a solid sugar. Um, Riser did it the most perfectly. 